Um, a lot of churches only talk about it once, and that's on Easter, right? And, and, and the thing is, is that I, I, I keep coming back that, that so many people really don't understand the power of the resurrection. Paul says it this way in Philippians 3.10. He says, I want to know Christ. And, and, and Philippians chapter 3 um, is one of my very favorite passages of all the New Testament because Paul's really just, just laying his heart out there and he's just talk, he goes, there's, there's, nothing, sur- there's nothing greater than the surpassing greatness of knowing Jesus. I want you to think about that, just that statement alone. Nothing is greater, there's nothing greater in this world than the surpassing greatness of just knowing Jesus. He goes on in verse 10, he says, I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection. So there's power in the resurrection. And he says, and participation in his sufferings, and I'm becoming like him. So Paul's like, I want to become like him in his death. That's, that's kind of, that's a, you know, we don't, we don't say amen on that one as much as like, I want to raise, I don't know that I want to die, right? But he says, I want to participate. He goes, there's so much power in, in this resurrection if it's real, and it is. But he's saying, man, since it is real, I want to participate in the sufferings, and I want to become like Jesus in his death. And so somehow, hear me, somehow attaining the resurrection from the dead. Guys, if there's not a resurrection from the dead, then we're all wasting our time and we might as well stay home. But because there is resurrection from the dead, there's a reason to shout. Man, I'll tell you what, when we start singing about the resurrection of our Lord, it gets me fired up. Because if he's raising from the dead, then there is a hope that we can raise from the dead. So last week we ended in 1 Corinthians 15, 17. He says, if Christ has not been raised, if not, right? If Christ has not been raised, your faith is useless. You hear that? If, if there is no resurrection from the dead, if there's, Jesus didn't raise from the dead, our faith as a whole is useless. I want you to think about how many faiths out there, how many different religions. There is no resurrection. They're, they're, they're gods that they worship haven't done anything. Ours has conquered death. So he says, our faith would be useless. We would still be guilty of our sins. In that case, all who have died, I want you to think about this. All who have died believing in Christ are lost. You hear that word lost? And if our hope in Christ is only for this life. There's a lot of people who start going to church because it makes them feel better. I mean, and it does. I feel better. Are you guys feeling better already today? I mean, I'll tell you what, if you're not, something wrong, right? So here's the deal. I feel better being in the house of the Lord. I feel better when I feel the Spirit moving in this house. I feel better when I hear other people's lives changing. So I feel better. But if that's the only reason I show up is so I can feel better today, then I am to be most pitied in all the world. If I'm only showing up to have that better life now, I have lost everything If it's only for now, if it's only for now, I'm wasting everything. So I'm going to jump several verses because I want to talk about the power of the resurrection. What does that look like for us? So we're going to jump down. We're in 1 Corinthians 15. We're going to jump down to verse 35. In verse 35, it says, someone will ask, how are the dead raised? I mean, are we talking about like a walking dead situation? You guys are laughing. I know who I, I just now needed to know who's watching it. Everybody else is just lying. They're like, don't, I don't want to. So here's the deal is if 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 there's I remember when I was a little kid and we watched the 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 Night of the Living Dead, the old black and white version, and only one of them was green. It was really weird. But anyways, I remember as a little kid, it scared me to death. I was real little. I snuck in when everybody was watching a scary movie. I was not supposed to be in the room. My mom does sorry, I'm confessing right now. My mom's finding out. 35 years later, I snuck into the room and I'm hiding there and it, this acid rain or whatever happens and everybody starts coming out of the graves, right? If that's what we're talking about, I don't want it. You know, like this thing's getting older. 
And I'm starting to have pains. And everybody's like, well, when you hit 40, I'm 42. And I start, you're right. There's a mark that something like something happens at 40. And it's like, Barbara's like, well, what is it? I'm like, I don't know. I've never had that pain before. It's new to me. Things aren't working as well as, and I'm like, this is only getting worse. Mom, it doesn't get better from here. And here's the reality is if it doesn't get better from here and I'm already past, well past my prime, I don't want that thing to come back out of the grave. So he says, somebody's going to ask, how are the dead raised? What kind of a body are we going to get? I don't want that one. It's all in agreement. I don't want this one. God, when I lay this one down, I don't want it back, right? I don't want this one back. I want a new one. And so he actually comes in and he goes, how foolish. What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. I love this. Listen, listen to that. What you sow does not come to life un- unless it dies. You can't live until you die. Come on. You can't really live until you die. This is awesome. I get so excited about when we're talking about the resurrection because, guys, this is the pinnacle peak of everything that we believe. If we can't get excited about the resurrection from the dead, then we don't really believe that, and you don't really believe in life after death. I signed up for life after death. I signed up for the whosoever, that's me, whosoever, and I hope it's you, whosoever believes has what? Everlasting life. That's what I signed up for. You can't really live until you die. So here's the reality. Every day, we're getting closer to death. I'm not getting younger, right? So every day, I'm actively dying. I know that sounds terrible, like, wow, man. But remember, you can't live until you die, right? So if I really believe that my real life, the one that I'm really hoping for, the one I really want is the next one, then get this. As I get closer to death, I'm actually getting closer to what? Life. Come on, right? The closer that I'm getting to death, I'm really getting closer to the goal that I want. The everlasting life, the new body, not this one. All right, so let's keep that in mind. You can't live until you die. So Jesus says this, and this is, so, so in, in John chapter, you like how that bounced in there? My, my daughter was like, oh, I like the bouncy one. I'm like, all right, I got you. I, I hooked my daughter up today. So Jesus says this, I am the resurrection and the life. I love this. I am. He says, I am. This is one of those powerful I am statements that Jesus made. He goes, I am the resurrection life. He who believes in me, though he may die, shall what? Come on, you got, okay, we're going to redo that. You got participation. Just like you guys got excited for Cheyenne. Don't leave me hanging, all right? He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall Live. live. Isn't that awesome? Death is not the end. It's just the beginning of eternal life. He says, though, do you believe this? Now, that's hard, right? Do you believe this? Do you believe this? You see, until you actually believe this, you're not going to share your faith. Why would you? Why would you share your faith if you don't even believe in the life after? You know... I started thinking about this. Why would I share something that I didn't absolutely believe to my very, very, very core? And last week, remember when we started looking at those statistics, we started realizing that most people who go to church don't share their faith. And we started realizing that there's a whole bunch of people who don't believe in a physical resurrection. They don't believe in a resurrection. Well, if you don't believe in that, why would you share any of this? The only thing that you'd have to share is like, hey, when I go to church, I feel better. You want to feel better? Come to church with me. Man, there, that's, that's the, if that's the only thing I'm hoping for, then I only have hope for this life, and I'm to be pitied more than anyone in the world. So he's saying, do you really believe this? I want you to think about this, parents. Anyone who has a child, what's the consequences? What's the, what's the after effects if I don't share my faith and impress my faith upon my children and they die without believing? Because according to the word, he who believes in me, Though he dies, 
he shall live. What about the one who doesn't? What are the implications of dying without believing? You see, 30% of Christians, 30% of Christians, people who go to church and say, I'm a Christian, 30% do not believe in a real hell. 30% of the church doesn't believe in it. But here's the deal. So then that, what that means is this. There are now biblical Christians who aren't biblical anymore. Because I'm telling you, the Bible says, what the Bible says is there's a lake of fire. There's a lake of fire. I don't want that place. See, there's only two eternal destinations, hell and heaven. And if I don't even believe that there's a hell, there's a problem. See, if you don't believe that there is a hell then why would you believe that there's a heaven? See, hell, the Bible says that hell was not actually created for man. It was actually created for the devil and his demons. And see, God never wanted, wanted any of us to go there. That's for the devil. But here's the problem is, and people say, well, if God's so loving, then why does he send? God doesn't send anyone. You send yourself. You have the choice. God's already paid the price. He was on the cross. He paid the price. He's offered a free gift of eternal life. Free, free, free. And if you don't receive it, that's on you. You send yourself to hell, not God. But there is a hell, and it's real. Eternal, eternal flames. 30% of the church doesn't believe that. What makes it worse is that 58%, which is pretty much 60, right? It's so close to 60. Christians believe that most all religions lead to heaven. What that means is this. All roads lead to heaven. Well, then that means that I have to start taking verses out of the Bible like John 14, 6. And so you said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one, no one, no one can get to the Father who's in heaven. Remember, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be his name, right? So Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one can get to the Father except through me. So the moment that Christians begin to believe, hey, we're all going there. We've already started taking verses out of the Bible. We're taking it away. Guys, if there is no truth, then what are we teaching? The Bible is truth. I don't even always have to like it, but it's the truth. Right? Has anybody ever been offended by what the Bible says? Right? How many of you have been offended when you went into the bathroom? You still go there. Right? Just making sure. I'm just throwing that out there. It's too late. It's out. I don't, I don't know where I go from here. We're going to move on. Next slide. Okay. So, we, so we're keeping this in. So I want to show you another verse. In Romans chapter 6. Check this out. It says this. If. Everybody say if. 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 So if we have been united together with Christ. So if I'm saved. If we have been united together in the likeness of his death, we shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. So if I'm united with Christ and I die in my faith, then I will also, like him, be resurrected. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. You see, here's the hard part is a lot of times we forget that all of us need to be saved. So how do we attain the resurrection is this, through salvation. But what do I need to be saved from? Well, the verse says we are crucifying that old so that we can do away with sin. I need to be saved from sin. That's what we need. That's what it is. I know what sin is. It's things that are not what God wants for my life. I need to crucify that old self. So that I can be done away. Who wants to continue to be a slave to sin? If any of you have ever been addicted to anything, you didn't want to be addicted. We didn't want that, right? I didn't want it. 
but it kept happening and I couldn't stop. I was a slave. That addiction owned, right? So what salvation says is we're crucifying that old person without Christ. And what happens is now I am freed. That's what redemption does is it frees me. It buys me out of slavery. So I don't have to be a slave to sin any longer. Well, let's get back to our verses. Verse 37. So when you sow, you do not. So he comes back to that concept. We're going back to our original passage. And he says, when you sow, so when you're planting, you do not plant the body that will be, but just a seed, perhaps of wheat or of something else. But God gives it a body as he determined. I want you to hear that. God Gives it a body as he so so most of us, you know, some of us take shortcuts when we garden and we go buy the the the, the, the tomato plant. Right? But that's not how it started. You guys know that, right? I mean, some of us are like, I just give me a bunch of those that are already no, what if you're doing it the 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 the, the original way, you take a seed and you put it into the ground. But it doesn't grow up looking like a seed, does it? So what he's saying is, listen, that seed has to go into the ground and it has to die so that the plant can become what it is. God gives it the body. So that's what, the, what we're dealing with is the resurrection. Some people are going to say, what kind of a body is going to be raised? So he's saying, listen, this thing dies, something better. I don't want the tomato seed. I want the tomato plant. Amen? Right? Unless you don't like tomatoes and you're like, I don't want either. But so I want you to continue to remember This all comes back to this one concept, how are the dead raised? So he's saying, listen, whatever kind of a seed. So now, let's keep going. In verse 39, it says, not all flesh is the same. People will have one kind of flesh. Animals have another, birds another, fish another. Those, uh, there are heavenly bodies, right? And there are earthly bodies. But the splendor of the heavenly body is one kind, and the splendor of the earthly body is another. Like, I look back at some of our wedding photos, and I was like, wow, man, that was back in my prime days. Like, man, I was pretty good looking. Now I got to cover it up with a beard, you know, and personality. That's what I was like. Sometimes I wake up next to Barbara, and I'm like, sorry, I'm not better looking. And she was not, no, oh, well, she is finer than frog's hair. I heard in frogs there, that's what I, I used, that was my pickup line. And also is the, my favorite is like, uh, I put the stud in Bible study. It's one of my, <laughs> men, you're welcome to use that. I, lo- I, I heard that you were looking for a, uh, a knight in shining armor, just so happened to put on the full armor of God this morning. You know, I mean, you know, like, I could do this all day. I could do this all day. <clears throat> so, all right, so. Look at the, 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 the shirt and like, did it hurt? Did what hurt? Fallen from heaven? That's what I'm talking about, you know? So, all right. So anyways, what I'm wanting you to understand is that here's the thing is that, you, you, you know, the earthly body has its own splendor. But when we're going to talk about the heavenly body, it's so much better. So he says they, they're different. One is earthly and one's heavenly. He says the sun has one kind of splendor and moon another, stars another. And different stars have different splendor than the other star. He goes, so it will be with the resurrection from the dead. The body that is sown perishable, it is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It's raised in glory. It's sown in weakness, raised in power, sown in the natural body, raised in the spiritual body. If there's a natural body, if there's a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. So here's the deal. Your best life is the one you have not yet lived. How cool is that? The best one is the one to come. See, that's, that, that, should, that should be something that's exciting because I want you to think about that. Your best life is the one to come. So here it is. The life you're now living right now, okay, so he says it is sown. Present tense means, you know, that, that, that it's happening. It's, you're currently living this life now. But passive means that you didn't have a choice. You didn't get to choose when you were sown. You were sown in this time. You didn't get to pick where you were sown, what conditions you were sown, what family you were sown in. So if you're sitting here going, well, I wish I was a part of another family. Uh, Sometimes like I tell my kids, I'm like, well, you're stuck in the Yoder family. Get over it. (laughs) 
There's no redos. You know, we're working the sheep today. Other families don't. Well, that's not the Yoder family right now. Take it up with the Lord. He put you here. You got a problem with it, you talk to him. Because I got a problem. I'm talking to him about you right now. <laughs> Did I have to have all the attitude? <laughs> kind of like Preston. I know what you're praying about, Mike. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't see you there, Preston. So, <laughs> you were hunkered down. Okay, my bad. I, I thought maybe you were sleeping. So, so, you didn't get to pick how you were sown, my friends. You didn't get that. So, so it, you, it happened to you. But here's the deal. You were sown in the perishable. So you, you, were, you were planted. God planted you in a life right now that ain't gonna, that, that's perishable. Your life will die. You will die at some point. Death is coming for all of us. That kind of sounds like a, like a scary nursery rhyme or something, you know. Rocking my baby in the treetop. You know, like, oh, yeah, sorry. So... <clears throat> That is kind of a creepy, if you ever like just put a creepy voice to that whole thing, and that's what we sing to our little babies, the cradle will rock, you know, <laughs> down comes the baby. Any mom's like freaking out, no, pray my soul to keep. <laughs> All right, anyway, sorry, I'm sorry. Wait, so that's why, that's the squirrel, that's the squirrel moment. If you're new, if you're new, it doesn't get any better than this, I'm sorry. I'm not the youth pastor. You already met him. <laughs> so, <laughs> I always wonder, like, Lord, why did you call me to be a pastor? And, and I think that there just needed to be something out there that was for somebody like you guys. I mean, you're all a bunch of nuts. You're here. You know what I mean? Like, so you wouldn't be here if you didn't like it. So you like it. You know it. So anyways, so... <laughs> So we're, we're, we're sown with a perishable body. Listen to this. You were sown in dishonor. Ooh, it doesn't even sound good. You were sown in weakness. Think about it. We get sick. We get fragile. We die. Sickness is everywhere. It's what we were sown in. We, we, were, we, we were here. You were sown in the natural. But listen to this. Your best life, the one that's to come, he says he's going to raise you. You're raised. That's also present tense. So it's actively happening. When, when, when you pass away, it happens. Passive means that he's also, you didn't get to choose being raised up either. So God sows you, but he also promises to raise you. Isn't that great? It's so good that he goes like, I'm going to sow you here, you know, in Warsaw, Missouri. I'm going to put you out here. And, uh, Good luck. I hope that you can raise yourself up. No, it's I'm going to put you here, but I'm going to raise you. I'm sowing you, but I'm going to raise you. That's the God we serve. He sows you, but he's going to raise you. And here's how. This is how. Imperishable. It means that when he raises you up, when you die and he raises you up, you'll never taste death again imperishable. Your body will never get old again. It will never hurt again. There will be no such thing as cancer, no sickness, no death, no pains, no hurting. He even says in the word, he wipes away our last tear. It's all done. The former way of life is going to be done. He raises you. It was dishonor. He sowed you, but he's raising you up in glory. He raises you up in strength. He raises you from a natural body, but he raises you a spiritual body. That sounds good. You guys agree? That sounds good. That's what I want. I'm signing up for that. So, it is written. The first man, Adam, became a living being. The last, Adam, a life-giving spirit. The spiritual did not come first, but the natural. And after that, the spiritual. The first man was the dust of the earth. The second man is of heaven. And as was the earthly man, so as are those who are of earth. Thank you. Is my, my voice starting to sound raspy and gravelly? I was talking about turkey hunting this last week, and you know, I was supposed to talk sweet to the girls, and I'm sure I just sounded raspy, like a raspy old hen. He's like, I'm not leaving my eight hens for that. No, it's not happening. So, anyways, so are those who are of earth. And as is the heavenly man, so are also those who are of heaven. So now, here's the deal. Have you ever noticed how hard it is to live in the spiritual when you're natural. 
right? I mean, I want you, this is so neat. As God was revealing this to me, I'm like, man, why is this so hard? Like, I love the Lord, amen, right? Like, like, we love you, God. I keep acting like an idiot. Like, I love you, but I'm stupid. Why do I keep, the, Paul even said that in Romans 7. He goes, man, I want to say the right things and do the right things, but I keep doing the wrong things. Anybody testify or am I the only good? All right. All right. Some of you are doing way better than I am in life. So it's hard to be spiritual when we're, when we're sown in a natural. So in Genesis chapter 5, it says this, Adam lived 130 years and begot a son in his own likeness after his own image and named him Seth. So here's the thing. I'm wanting you to see this. Okay. We're naturally born in the image of man. Now, I, I'm, I'm not taking away Genesis where it says we were created in the likeness of God. I'm not, but I am wanting you to see that, like, Malachi, I looked at his, like, young pictures, and I looked at my young picture, and I'm like, wow, we look in the likeness, right? You guys, you guys feel me, all right? So, here's the thing. In verse 49 of the chapter that we're studying, and just as we have been born in the image of earthly man, so we've been born in this image of earth, so shall we bear the image of an... Shall is future tense. I don't have the image of the heavenly body yet. Meaning that I'm still in a natural body. I'm wanting you to understand this. I'm wanting you to see this. Okay? So, so I'm, I'm sown in a natural human earthly body. I will, sh- I will at some point when I die. Okay? Okay? It will happen. So not yet. So here's the thing. But you are more than just man's image bearer. I want you to understand that. You're more than just an image bearer. In, in Romans, in Romans 8.29, you like that, the curtain? That's what happens when you have kids telling you how to do slides. I'm like, oh, that looks kind of fun. So anyways, Romans 8.29, for whom he foreknew, right? For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of a son, that we might be the firstborn among... So, though, though I do not have the image of heaven yet, do you know why? Because I'm not dead yet. It made me think of Monty Python, the Holy Grail. I don't know if anybody's watched that. It's like, I'm not dead yet. And the guy's like, shut up, you soon will be, you know? And so, the reason why I don't bear the image... Pastor Paul's like, mm, 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 no. Nah. Are you writing down all the words that I'm saying right now? <laughs> You're going to leave that part out. Okay, so though he foreknew, so, so I am being conformed to the image of son. So here's the thing. I'm not yet, I'm not yet the image of heaven, but when I'm born again, I do bear the image of the son. Come on now. Like, I know that when I die, I begin to get a new body, a heavenly body, and I will bear the image of heaven. I right now bear the image of earth because that's where I'm at. But in the meantime, I'm more than just this image bearer of earth. I get to be the image of the sun. That's what this says, conformed to the image of a sun. But I must be born again. John says this, that which is born Flesh is flesh, but that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. So let me take you. We're going to bring this towards an end, my friends. I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. My fleshly body's not getting to heaven. It's going to be left here. Nor does perishable inherit imperishable. He goes, listen, I'll tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. There's a day. It's coming. Now, as I get to the next two verses, I want to continue to remember how this all began. Someone's going to ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body? Here it is. For the perishable must clothe itself with imperishable, and the mortal must with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with imperishable, and the mortal with immortality, then this is, gonna, this is so neat. So we're getting, this, he, he, we're getting this picture. He goes, okay, your body isn't going to heaven like it is. 
your perishable body, it's got to put on an imperishable. And the mortal, which dies, must with immortality, it doesn't die. Then, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. And death, yeah. In, in this moment, when you start thinking about it, he goes, when, you, when this happens, the moment that you die, death loses. He loses. Can you imagine his, 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 his job description? Yeah, you're going to kill people. All right, okay. But anytime that you kill a, you, you know, you take a Christian, you, you actually just raise them into eternal life. You're welcome. Like, man, can you imagine that? You know, let's do a review of how this, well, you know, I went over and touched that guy and sent him straight to heaven. Now he's got eternal life with Jesus. That's great, you know. I mean, we're looking at this. I mean, what's so amazing is that the moment death thinks that he's going to do something, he takes you, he takes that last breath, he just gives you, he just takes that last breath and you continue to breathe on and wake up in the land of glory. (laughs) Death has been swallowed up in victory. And then it goes on, so he's quoting Paul's quoting Isaiah 25, 8, and then he goes on to quote Hosea, and he says, where, O oh, death, is your victory? This is a mockery. <laughs> hey, death! Loser! I mean, like, the who, the her. I mean, I mean, like, he's, he ain't winning! Where, O oh, death, is your sting? So then, how can Paul, or anyone else say this, how can Paul say, you know, where is your victory? See, only resurrection can defeat death. So when he says, where is your victory? The only way that death can win if there is no resurrection, because you stay dead. But because of a resurrection, because of the power of the resurrection, death loses every time he takes a Christian. We are raised imperishable and immortal and will never see it again. The next verse, he says this. You like that? I love that one. That was my favorite one. The sting of death, right? So the sting of death is sin. Verse 56a, the sting of death. So, so here's the deal. Where did death come from? It started in Genesis 3. Death was never a part of the original plan. Adam and Eve decided they had to eat the fruit of tree and Jesus. And then the Lord said this, if you eat of that tree, you will surely so they allowed death. Sin brought death in. And in fact, we can see that in, in Romans 5.12. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, that's Adam, good job, and death through sin, because that was you will surely die, and this way death came to all people because all sinned. Now, in the very next verse, it says this, 56, and the power of sin is the law. And here we go. Romans again, 7, and this is this. What shall we say? Is law sinful? Because he says the power of sin is the law. Well, what does that mean? I think in Romans, it best explains it. Is, is the law sinful? Certainly not. Nevertheless, I would not have known what sin was had it not been for the law. For I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said thou shalt not covet. Have you ever noticed, well, how I, ha- I underline this, but sin seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, producing me every kind of coveting. Have you ever noticed that when you're not supposed to do something, there's like a law, a speed limit? And we just kind of like, well, I'm just going over five, five over, right? I mean, it's almost like every time, don't eat a cookie, what's go- what do you want? You want the cookie. Don't eat this, f- uh, that's what I want. Every time we're told not to do something, why is it? Parents, that every time you tell your kid not to do something, that's ex- don't you date that boy. I like that. I will. Are you kidding me? So what I'm going to start doing is finding the best little Christian boys. I'm like, don't date that boy. <laughs> right? Don't you dare date that one who loves Jesus. So why is it? Because we're natural. Because we have this natural, sinful thing inside of us that doesn't want to do the right thing. 
He goes, we wouldn't have even known about it, but the law came in. So that's why it says the power of sin is the law. Because the moment I knew what I wasn't supposed to do, I started wanting to do it. He says, for apart from the law, sin was dead. Once I was alive, apart from the law. But when the commandment came, sin sprang to life and I died. But thanks be to God. Everybody say, thanks be to God. But thanks be to God, he gives us victory through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So giving us victory is present active participle. What I love about this. So he gives us victory. This is present active participle. So present means this. We are continuously living in victory. So when he says thanks be to God. So this is, this is the last verse, guys. My last slide. There's just a whole bunch of bouncy things. It's okay. Here's the deal. We are continuously, this is what he's saying, but he, he, but he gives us victory through our Lord and Savior Jesus. So we are living right now. Though I am going to die in this body, I get to live right now in victory of Jesus. Right now, I get to live in victory every day. You are living in victory. You're living in victory every day. Every day. So that's what that means. And then active means this. Is that Jesus is the one giving you victory. You don't have to go win the battle. He's already won the battle. He already won. And you get to live in it every single day. Participle is so cool. Because it's it's a verbal adjective. And it means that I am known by his victory. Right? We are known. So a verbal adjective is how people would describe you. The action of your life describing you. You are living a victory you didn't have to fight. Provided for you every single day. And it was given to you. And that's how other people know you. Because you live in victory every single day. (laughs) Isn't that awesome? And and so I had to throw this one little verse in here in Acts 9, 19, 15. And I even did the twirly thing for you. I I get excited. I'm going to have to stop nerding out so much. But anyways, so what was so amazing about this is this. He says the the evil spirit. So there was an evil spirit. Somebody was trying to drive out a demon. And they they weren't saved. They were just trying to do it because other people were doing it. And the demon said this. Jesus I know. And Paul I know. But who are you? Here's what's really cool. When we are born again and we are saved, (laughs) you already have the victory. And they already know who you are. You are known by the victory already given to you. So the moment that the devil starts messing with you, right? You guys started talking. These ladies came back after the retreat and said, man, I wasn't ready. Here's the deal. You already have the victory. Make sure you stand in it. Make sure you, you let the devil know, I've already won. Get out of here. I already got the victory. You're living in it today. So you don't have to wait for the victory. It's already done. Huh? Come on now. The victory's already been given to you, and you get to walk in it every single day. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Man, I, I, I feel like there are some people here today. There are some of us today that need some victory. I want to get the, 